When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, when the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Thou shalt prepare thee a way, and divide the coasts of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit, into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither. And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee unto one of those cities and live lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him, because the way is long and slay him. Whereas he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him not in time past. Wherefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt separate three cities for thee, and if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, and giveth thee all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee beside these three, that the innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. And if any man hate his neighbor, and lie in wait for him, and rise up against him, and smite him mortally that he die, and fleeth into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence, and deliver him to the hand of the avenger of blood, that he may die. Thine hand shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, that it may go well with thee. Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established." If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the man between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. Interesting chapter here. We'll waste no time and get into Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 1. When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Thou shalt prepare thee a way and divide the coasts of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit, into three parts, that every slayer may free, flee thither. So God here introduces what he's talking about again. We're talking about his land. He promises to give his people, and he wants it to be divided up in three. There he says, you'll set a way, specifically at the beginning of verse 3, prepare thee a way and divide the coasts of thy land. I think that's essentially saying there's going to be highways that are clearly marked, labeled, everybody's aware of them, which actually divide their whole nation into three parts. When he says do so, he asks that they appoint a specific area within these three lands, cities, where the slayer may flee thither. Now, 
Who is this slayer? Keep your finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 19. And go back with me to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. We have a little bit more of an explanation. So God here is laying out the land. He's promising to give them. All of the inheritance would be theirs simply by way of them entering into the land. They wouldn't have to fight. They wouldn't have to war in order to drive the people out. But once they got there, he certainly knows that there's going to be some contentions and some um, issues that come up. And here he's talking about someone that killeth someone ignorantly. Okay. So in Deuteronomy chapter 35, there's a little more detail in verse 16. It says, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. That murderer shall surely be put to death. Here he's going to define what a murderer is, and we're going to figure out thereby what the slayer then would be. Verse 17, And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die, in other words, he wants him to die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, so this is a specific weapon that was fashioned of wood, wherewith he may die, he intends that he would die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. In other words, murderers, um, it was allowable and acceptable and even commanded here that those that were the revenger of blood would be able to slay the murderer. Likely somebody that was a witness, likely somebody that was close to the one that was murdered would be the one that was the revenger of blood. Verse 20 then, it says, But if he thrust him of hatred, or hurl at him by lying in wait that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. But if he thrust him suddenly, here's the contrast, without enmity, or have cast upon him anything where, where, without laying of weight, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him, that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought he his harm, then the congregation, verse 24, shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. So, essentially, the one who kills somebody, but it was an accident, throws a stone and it harms him. Um, accidents happen all the time. And we've heard of this in the Bible as slayer. We know of the term as manslaughter, manslayer, I believe is that where we got it from. So he's saying that if there is an accidental death that happens, then the one who killed the man, being innocent of murder, but nonetheless took a life, is able to flee into one of these cities of refuge, one of three that was described later on in Deuteronomy, but here in Numbers. The place is also given here in the Bible, but we don't need to go into much detail there. Um, so, essentially, the congregation delivers the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. He goes into the area that was where he abides, where that specific city of refuge was given, and he's able to then abide there, the Bible says, until the death of the high priest, the one that was anointed with oil. And that would be the time frame of which you would abide there. So certainly killing somebody ignorantly isn't free of its consequence. He's no longer allowed to leave that city. The Bible is going to tell us in another place that if he does leave that city of refuge, he's free game. The revenger of blood can come and destroy him. His only place of solace was to stay hidden within this area that was specifically described by God. And I think this is a good thing. This is a blessing that God would provide that protection. Otherwise, everybody's just going to be taking whatever they deem to be justice into their own hands and often harming somebody that the Lord would deem innocent in this case. We're continuing on into verse 26, and it says, But if the slayer shall at any time 
come without the border of the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the border of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So these things shall be for a statute and for a judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And so God here is providing a safe place from the attacks of people, especially when somebody is innocent. And they were judged innocent by the congregation that surrounds them. They know the circumstance. They know what happened. They heard the testimony of the case of which the manslayer did not commit the crime, did not commit any crime actually, worthy of death because it was an accident. There was no enmity. The, the, the stone was thrust and he didn't see the man that it fell upon. Completely innocent of putting that man into harm's way and thereby causing the death. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, now that we know the difference clearly between the slayer and the murderer, it's all about intent here. What was the intent of the action? Was it an accident or was it purposeful? Purposeful murder is worthy of death every time. In the first degree, it's murder that is premeditated. This is not premeditated, therefore we would call it, I think, third degree murder. And it's somebody that did it ignorantly and they did not mean to kill the person. So verse 4 continues on in that vein. It says, And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live. So he's fleeing there to the end that he may live. It says, Whosoever killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood and his neighbor to hew a stone, with his neighbor to hew wood, sorry, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee into one of those cities and live. So you're chopping down wood, you're working next to your neighbor, and that axe head just flies off and hits him, strikes him dead. That is an accidental death. Nevertheless, look what God provided for and talked about. This slayer, he's not worthy of death, but in verse 6 it says, lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer. Now, in the moment it says, while his heart is hot. So in the moment, people don't often listen to reason. Two men go out into a woods. There's an accidental death by way of an axe flying off, axe head flying off, an axe handle, strikes someone dead. When he comes out of the woods and tries to explain it to the revenger of blood, maybe it's the dad, maybe it's the wife, maybe it's who's, whosoever it is that would be deemed an avenger of blood, whose heart is hot in the instant, they're not going to readily hear reason at this moment, are they? They're upset that their loved one is dead. They're not going to necessarily be thinking clearly, and they may strike the person that is not worthy of death, the slayer. They may strike them dead in a moment, in, in that heated moment, and therefore somebody that was not worthy of death falls dead as a result. And so, in Deuteronomy 19, God here is giving very clear commands so that when the avenger of blood is hot, their heart is hot, and they would pursue the slayer and overtake him, verse 6 says, because the way is long and slay him, wherewith he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him in time past. It says, wherefore I command thee, saying, thou shalt separate three cities for thee. That's the purpose of these three cities. They would be central, I believe, to the area that they were living in. They would be someone, somewhere that all people would know where it was. And so when the accident happens, instead of the slayer having to go and explain it in his own town where that avenger is close, he goes directly to this city of refuge and finds solace there so that basically some space can be given between them. He would ha have safety there. The avenger would be removed from the scenario. And the townspeople, the congregation, the Bible says, would be able to then judge the scenario and find out whether it in fact is a case of manslaughter or if it's a case of murder. I like this because it gives space for judgment to take place without that, that angry mob mentality creeping up. When, and so often when things happen, when somebody 
looks at a scenario and they find somebody guilty, they're hot. Their heart is hot and they're going to judge and be judge, jury, and executioner in that moment. But this is actually a provision that God allowed, knowing the hearts of men, that they are fully set to behave that way. He wanted some separation in that moment because the Bible is clear. The neighbor killed him ignorantly. He didn't intend to harm him. He did it completely as an accident. And therefore, he went and found refuge and solace. And therefore, people were able to separate the avenger from the slayer until judgment could be made. And also so that the hearts could calm down and people could start to see reason in this matter. He says, separate the three cities. Verse 8 continues and says, And if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, and he hath, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, and giveth thee all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, and to walk ever in his ways, then thou shalt add three cities more for thee besides these three. Watch this. That innocent blood be not shed in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. His whole purpose in doing this is that innocent blood would not be shed. God isn't obviously overjoyed that the accident happened, that, that life happened, death and chance happeneth to us all, the Bible records. Not everything that happens is some miraculous will of God. Simply chance happens to men. Death and chance happen to men. Circumstances happen. Accidents happen and people fall victim to the, just, just nature taking its course. Death happens. Death is all around us. That's not something that we can escape, nor is it something that's always completely God's control. People say, oh, why did that accident happen? Why didn't God stop it? Well, because God isn't in the business of intervening in every aspect of men's lives. God is certainly there and able to intervene if he so chooses, but God put free will here. God also gave nature a spin and just lets it run its course. Nature is just a natural um, the natural world that we live in is one of, of freak accidents, unfortunately. Not everything God is, is over. But I believe he could be. God could be this Calvinistic, strange God that, that says, you know, walks into the baby's, um, you know, the, 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 the room where all the babies are born and just says, like, you're going to get saved, you're going to get saved, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell. God's also just over every single circumstance that happens, you know, because the Calvinist God says, like, well, technically that rape was the will of God. Give me a break. They say that, oh, that car accident was entirely the will. He predestined it. I don't believe that at all. I believe that God has a will for mankind, and the above all paramount will is that everybody would be saved and come to the knowledge of Him as Savior, okay? That's the main message of this book. But then there's also a lot of stuff that's in here that's simply men's choice, including our salvation. We can get saved or not get saved. It's up to us. We can go to the store or not go to the store. It's up to us. Buy the house, don't buy the house. It's up to us. Get married, don't get married. All of those choices are up to us. And so, as God has set these things in order for us, so nature runs a similar course. Some things are kind of random. Some things um, just happen by chance. Some things happen by, by just, just sure, I don't even know how to explain it. But, but God kind of wound it up and let it happen. And that's how this world is. And therefore, we can't blame anything on him. But one thing that God here is trying to emphasize, why he gave these cities of refuge, is that he knows that accidents will happen, and he knows that men's hearts will be hot in those moments. And so he wants to ensure that innocent blood is not shed in the land. Now, we have then verse 7 through 10, we just read that. He wants innocent blood to be not shed in the land that he plans to give us. And so blood be upon them. So no blood be upon them is the desired goal. He does not want the land to be filled with blood. And why is that the case? I should have told you, but stay, go back to Numbers chapter 35. <clears throat> Numbers 35 and keeping your place in Deuteronomy. Why is blood being upon a land a big deal? In the same context of these places of refuge that God set forth, he gives us an explanation in Numbers chapter 35 and in verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land 
wherein you are. So is he talking here about not recycling or having too much carbon emissions? Is that what pollutes our land? Is he talking about not throwing your trash on the ground or, you know, um, minding your, your green footprint and all of these things? Is, is that what pollutes our land? Should we all go to electric vehicles because we're going to pollute the land? No, what pollutes the land is clear here. Now, mind you, we should be good stewards of our land, and I don't like when people litter. I don't let Caleb litter. He gets in big trouble for it. And we should try to drive a vehicle that that's, you know, not blowing smoke everywhere, though sometimes I have to. Mine burns oil like crazy, so, you know, it is what it is. So shall you not pollute the land, it says, why? For blood it defileth the land. So the one thing that pollutes our land, which God constantly refers to, isn't the effects of mankind. In fact, God made men to inhabit the earth, and he made the earth for men to inhabit it. It's this, it's this relationship that we and the earth have one with another, and the earth wants more of us just as much as we should want more of us here. We're good for the earth, I believe, if we take good care of it and use it properly. It says, blood, though, defileth the land, and look at this, the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. And so this is the reason why God instituted the death penalty. Because if somebody is murdered, the only way to remove that pollution, the only way to remove that defilement of the land is to put the murderer to death. It set things right. It sets things back to equilibrium. And so we see then why this is so important. I preached the death penalty for several weeks and People might be like, well, why are we doing that? Because in a righteous land that is following the will of God, they should be at equilibrium at some point because everybody that commits a murder ought to be put to death for that murder. Everyone that, that, that does all of that plethora of things, including witchcraft, ought to be put to death for those things in order that the land would find equilibrium. And yet it's not so. Continuing on in verse 34, it says, Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. And I believe God is far from dwelling in Canada. And part of the reason is because our land is defiled. Our land is polluted. Our land is not just polluted and defiled as a result of the murders that are not properly being managed by putting to death the murderer and therefore therefore cleansing the land of the blood that was shed therein. But think of all the others, kidnapping and trafficking that goes on and the violence that is, is associated with that. Those criminals ought to be put to death in order that equilibrium would be found in our land. Our land would be cleansed and no longer defiled. What about the amount of abortions that take place? Murder upon murder upon murder. Thousands upon thousands, day by day, week by week, month by month, young innocent child. God says there should not be innocent blood shed in the land. And what blood is more innocent than that of a child? Those little child's children in the womb have not even had a chance to be removed from their innocency. There's no sin in a little baby, right? They have not entered into the world, first and foremost. They have not entered into a place of accountability for the sin nature that they have within them. There is nothing more innocent and precious and wonderful than a child in a womb, and yet scores and droves of them are being murdered every day in this nation. So no wonder that God doesn't abide here. And no wonder that our land is polluted and defiled. And, 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 it, and it ought to be set back so. But how is God going to set it back so? Well, the Bible here is clear that the only way that Canada could ever be cleansed of the blood that was shed here is by shedding the blood of the murderers themselves. And I believe that one day when God talks about in the last days blood being up to the horse bridles as he comes to judge this world and as Jesus comes with a garment that was spotless and white but is now spattered with blood, it's going to be as a result of God setting things right again. Cleansing, purifying, removing the defilement from a land that is polluted because of the many innocent lives that were ruined and destroyed in the nations of this world. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Blood defileth the land, 
Canada is certainly defiled. And that's clear. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 11. It says, but if any man hate his neighbor. So here's the flip side of the scenario we just talked about. God doesn't want innocent blood to be shed. So he allows for the one that commits murder ignorantly, accidentally to flee and have refuge and solace in a place for a time so that he wouldn't be judged for a crime that he did commit it and therefore innocent blood be shed in the land. Now the flip side in verse 11 is if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities. So here he's trying to abuse the system. He actually hated his neighbor. He laid in wait for his neighbor. He did all those things that back in Deuteron or in Numbers chapter 35, the Bible referenced as being murder, right? He murdered his neighbor in cold blood, rose up against him, hating him previous, laid in wait for him, smote him mortally. It says if that happens and he flees into the city of refuge anyways, it says here, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence. And deliver him to the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. The congregation was judging these matters. And it was clear to them that a murder had taken place. And so they walked into the city of refuge and said, Uh-uh, this isn't what it's for. Removed them forcibly and brought them to the avenger of blood so that justice could take place. Look at verse 13. It says, or verse uh, 13 Thine eyes shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. And so we read before that the only way to set this right, the only way that the blood of this murder would not defile the land is if the murderer was put to death. And so God here is saying he doesn't want innocent blood shed in the land, so he doesn't want murder. He also doesn't want anybody to be covering up for murder. So he doesn't want the people to allow for somebody that causes murder to step into the city and just find refuge. And therefore this, this city just become a horde of murderers and filthy people that are just trying to hide away. No, no, no. Judgment was made in that city. That city ought to be quite righteous of a city because judgment was constantly taking place there. People enter in and they're like, why are you coming here? What happened? Explain it to us. Judgment is made about each and every case before they let them in. The people that are there are certainly hurting because I don't know about you, but if I went out with my good friend and I was hewing lumber and my axe head fell off, I would be certainly upset if it destroyed him and killed his life. I would be just as upset perhaps as his wife and his family and his kids but the difference is is that i caused the pain and i can never live down that guilt certainly but i can go to the city of refuge and i can live that time out safe from the avenger of blood because his wife may be cross with me and want me destroyed and his children may want revenge from me but the best thing for both of us is to get healing separate from one another so that the land would be not defiled and that neither of us would have innocent blood destroyed. Certainly it would be a hard thing to face, and that time served wouldn't be one of joy in that city of refuge, but nevertheless, that's what was allowed. I could keep my life, though the life was taken, and my life would be a little bit different now as I'm concealed to this city of refuge for a time. <clears throat> we don't want innocent blood shed in our land. We also don't want to conceal, cover up, or not judge those that shed innocent blood. Here is a charge in the word of God again just to do judgment and justice. Just to properly evaluate scenarios. Look at what happened as a group come together and judge the scenario. Hearing from witnesses and then, and then ultimately laying down a judgment that God would see fit. I love the Bible because God is a God of judgment and justice and this word is a word of judgment and justice as a result. We continue on. And here's just another example. Verse 14. It says, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. you know what that means? Your neighbor has a landmark. This is their property from these four posts inward. It, removing their landmark, somebody might not even know, but what people sometimes do and it's and it's wicked it shows greed it shows covetousness is that when nobody's around they'll do secret theft they'll lift that landmark walk three feet this way and drop it there 
thereby robbing their neighbor of their inheritance and their proper possession. And that's not right, and that's wicked, and that's not proper justice and judgment. God here commands, don't remove thy neighbor's landmark. Rather, leave it be. That's your neighbor's possession. That's your neighbor's property. Continuing on in verse 15, a pivotal, a pivotal principle here that we always see time and time and time again in the scriptures is one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. And I was talking to Brother Chad when he was down here on Monday, who was gloriously baptized there. It was a wonderful day. I was talking to him about this and how God essentially keeps his own rules. When God gives you a doctrine, I have the same principle, I believe, and I found it always to be true, inherent in scriptures, is that God does not give you a doctrine with just one witness. If you find one obscure passage that seems to be teaching something like at the end of Mark, when it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, you can't go and take that one witness of Mark and make a doctrine out of that. No, I believe that God himself follows these rules in his word. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word, every matter be established. God puts that in there. He's not keeping himself accountable, but he's showing that he's a keeper of his word. He's showing that he is his embodiment of words. He's also giving us a good principle for how to live our lives. And of course, God would follow those same principles himself. And so don't make a doctrine out of one witness in scripture, one verse. Make sure you got two or three, or in the case of believe only for salvation, hundreds, right? That's how you know that it's a sure doctrine. So believe, 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 believe. Oh, believe and be baptized. What kind of crazy person goes and makes a doctrine out of that? It doesn't even make sense. God is clear. With mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And this is important in all aspects of judgment. Because that's what we're doing when we make doctrines too. We are looking at the word of God and we are judging what we think God is trying to say. And if God is saying it over and over and over and over, he is being clear with us that that is not only a principle, but that is a doctrine of the Word of God. And the same thing ought to be true in all matters of our judgment. We need matters that are established only at two or three or more witnesses. And this is a very serious principle because false witness is a serious offense. And it's one that people just flippantly don't care about anymore. It's so easy to go online and type in, I know this about somebody, and, and you have no clue. It's so, so easy to whisper and backbite about something that you certainly, you know that this is the case, but you've only judged it according to your own thoughts and, and, and opinions on a matter. One witness ought not rise up. You need to have two or three. It's not pardonable offense. This is a serious and a, and a, and a detrimental offense for someone to commit. I've been learning this saying, <laughs> if somebody is a bad person, you don't need to exaggerate their badness. You shouldn't need to accentuate the things that they have done. You shouldn't be able to remove what they're saying, doing, behaving like out of the context. What is witnessed ought to be enough. Two or three or more ought to see the case and judge accordingly, bring it to the proper channels, and then simply the judgment is made. We don't need to be exaggerating the charge of people. We don't need to lie about people, slander people, rail against people in order that they would be condemned. Witnesses ought to be just. It's a principle that is pivotal to the Christian life. We continue on in verse 16 and find out why false witness is such a problem and how God views it and what he did to deal with it. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests, and the judges, these three, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother. These days we might just do a little, sorry, sorry, I, I, I said that about you, it wasn't true. 
at, at best, but most people just kind of carry on as if it never happened. But look at God's ways. He says, verse 19, Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put away the evil from among you. That's righteous judgment. Can you imagine how much lies and slander and backbiting and railing would disappear if whatever you were accusing your brother of falsely was just the judgment was thrown back at you when the, when the truth came out? He murdered somebody. Diligent inquisition. No, 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 he didn't murder anybody. What happens to the accuser? Death penalty. I saw him steal something. I know that he stole five hundred dollars from from the cash register. I saw that. Oh, okay. Well, the crime for that, or the the punishment for that, is to return sevenfold. They make diligent inquisition. They check the tapes. They ask a few witnesses. Oh no, he didn't steal it. Now you owe us thirty five hundred bucks for your false witness you brought against your neighbor. God says. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. And there's a great evil these days of false witness roaring around in this world. People always just lying about people saying, we're going to see more and more of this in the last days. People making up stories. And you're seeing this when people will lie about, you know, this person had this party and there was like 500 people there. And they just exaggerate these things. And when the judgment happens, it wasn't even so. They talk about in the news, they're, they're the worst for false witness, aren't they? They're like, oh, there was this beach party and there was like 300 people there. And you actually check it out. And it was just interesting camera angles that showed that there was only about 25 people there. And this is what's happening in our latter days. But what we need to understand is, first and foremost, as Christians, no false witness is okay. One witness shall not rise against any man, but at the mouth of two or three. And we need to know that this is how God feels about it. If you're going to put your witness out there, you better make sure that it is true. Because God is the judge these days, just because men don't enact God's laws. So if God was going to smite a Christian seriously for an offense that they have done, if God was going to rain down on them and really punish them in this life to straighten them out, and it's found that you simply false falsely accused them you were a false witness in the matter wouldn't you have it like it says in nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 4 turn their reproach upon their own head and this is what happens the reproach that you put on somebody you know what god does he just turns it around right back on you you reap what you sow you're judged according to the measure you meet is how christ put it don't be so quick to judge people especially if you don't have all the facts it's important God talks about it way back in Deuteronomy, and this principle goes throughout all of scriptures. Verse 20, And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil thing among you. Amen. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for it. Life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. In other words, God's justice is setting things back to normal. One eye for one eye, one foot for one foot, one hand for one hand. Justice is served is what God is referring to here. I'm thankful that God here gives a sanctuary so that blood shouldn't be shed in the land. He allows for proper judgment to take place. He lays out very specifically that it can't be one witness that makes the judgment. You need multiple so that a matter can be diligently looked into so that we can determine whether the witnesses now are true or false. And we can set things right in our land. We need more of this. We need more judgment in our land. And we need it to start first in the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God, the Bible says. Not only God judging and looking down upon us, but hey, reflect on yourself. Think about yourself and how you're behaving in the matter of judgment and justice. And do right. Thank you, God.